on one level, it's very important to understand how the Cooper pairs form, and that tells you about TC. Uh, so if you're a physicist, TC is very important, it tells you a lot about the material. If you're an engineer, however, there's a more important variable, and that's JC. So it's not the temperature at which the material superconducts at, it's the current it will carry at the temperature you want to apply it. Now, that opens up a very different world to that of understanding the microstructural um, pairing mechanism between electrons. What it does is it tells you about the electromagnetic properties of the material, and that means you can engineer and you can design with that. Wherever there's a high energy density required, bulk materials are the natural choice. One way of looking at the trap field capability of a bulk superconductor is to consider it as a solenoid. A very special solenoid without a power supply, but nevertheless a constant current density flowing around its interior. Uh, if you do that, you very quickly show that there are two important parameters. One is the critical current density, and the second one is the sample size. And the flux trapping capability is determined by the product of those two. So it's okay to go to bigger samples, provided you don't degrade JC. If you were to increase the sample size by a factor of two, but JC were to come down by more than a factor of two, you wouldn't improve trap field. So as long as you can maintain JC, the bigger the sample, the better to give you the highest trap field. Uh, the world record trap field is 17 Teslas at 29 Kelvin, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, if you look at uh, the amount of energy in there, it's more than 100 times the energy density of ferromagnetic iron, fully magnetised, which is the greatest or strongest ferromagnet that we know. So we can make these very large magnetic fields in samples of a given size. Now the problem there is that the forces on these samples are enormous. So you have to reinforce the materials, and you can do that either by steel banding, so you put a steel band around and you have a hoop stress that resists the explosive stress on the superconductor, and or you can encapsulate in uh, carbon fibre uh, resin, uh, or you can drill a hole down the middle and you can put a good thermal conductor there, so if there's any instability then you get rid of the heat very efficiently and you don't lose superconductivity. For bulk materials we understand pinning, uh, the defects the defects which are introduced, the 2 one, one uh, phases. The greater the number of 2 on one particles we have, and the finer their size, the better the pinning and the bigger the current. Um, there is a slight problem, and the problem is that we're using the 2 one, one to control the growth process. We're also trying to control the pinning with 211, and the two things are very different. If we have a material at high temperature for a long time, which we'd like to control the growth, the 211 coarsens. If we want the 211 to be fine, then that means we have a, a much shorter time at high temperature. The two are contradictory. Um, so a lot of effort has gone into refining the 211 density and size down to the diameter of a flux line, which is a few nanometers at 77 Kelvin. But so far, the best anybody has done has been a few tenths of microns. So in other words, 100 times too big. But during that processing, uh, microcracks and microcracks form. Uh, they're very good in that they're useful for getting oxygen into the material, but macrocracks are very bad in that they stop current flowing. You know, a lot of people put in rare earth excesses and form nanoparticles of rare earth oxides. And that is a good method, but you must control their distribution and make sure that there's no segregation to the grain boundaries. Um, a much better way of uh, engineering pinning centres is to introduce a nanoscale second phase inclusion. Such a particle is a 2411 phase, M, and the M can be a range of different elements, there are diff about 16. Now this particular material doesn't react with the barium cuprate at elevated temperatures, so we keep the good superconducting properties. Um, it doesn't change its geometry, um, and it disperses well in the material. So rather than having the 211, which is then free to control the growth process, we have a second pinning phase which determines the electrical properties. From a practical point of view, the rare earth ions alone, if you have a single rare earth 1, 2, 3, that's not going to help you to improve the properties very much. And when you mix them, you modulate the structure in a different way by having nano-sized strain fields and um, it's those strain fields which can be very important for um, enhancing pinning. To introduce pressure into the compound by replacing one ion of the structure by a smaller ion, which would mean that you let the rest uh, of the structure uh, put pressure on the whole system because you leave more space. Another possibility is to substitute smaller strontium for barium and reduce the distance between copper oxygen planes. So by this procedure, we can increase the Josephson current along the C direction and increase the 
superconducting properties of this material. However, this procedure decreases the superconducting transition temperature drastically. The third place where we can alternate the structure for IPCO is the copper oxygen chains. By introducing molybdenum for copper in the copper chains, we create the small nanoscale defects. The defects are dimers of octahedral and these defects work as effective pinning centers. Small amount of molybdenum creates two peaks which are beneficial for the pinning force. However, too much molybdenum decreases pinning at low fields. Take combinations of rare earth element, for example NEG, uh, neodymium, europium, gadolinium bearing cuprate, uh, that will give you very high irreversibility properties at 77 Kelvin, uh, but also there's some evidence to suggest that grain boundaries are less likely to form if you have this combination of elements.